All right, welcome back, folks. Now we're going to dive deep into big data some more, talk about how to handle it via compression, and how to be able to search better with metadata. So let's kind of have some comparisons. So Netflix uh, is said to have one pebibyte uh, to store the video for streaming. That's how much video it has for streaming, how much it stores. World of Warcraft has a number of 1.3 pebibytes. Okay? The Internet Archive, all the Internet that's archived regularly, for, and many snapshots have been taken, is 10 pebibytes. Okay? AT&T transfers 30 through its networks every day. That's incredible. Every day, 30 pebibytes is going through that. And YouTube processes 40 pebibytes of video a day. That's unbelievable. B video blows away any other number. And YouTube is just the amount of, I mean, the real, if you ask yourself, who is the real heavy lifters of data on the internet, I would say it's not Amazon, it's not Google, it is YouTube. YouTube has such an incredible load to lift up all the video. Everyone in the whole world is uploading and handle that and be able to serve it to you is an unbelievable task. So I, you know, I, I bow to the engineers of YouTube who are doing such an amazing job to get all that stuff. And to be able to step it down, if you have a really s small channel, your bandwidth is very low, it will then give you the smaller video. It will say, oh, I'm not able to give you video fast enough. I'll give you the small thumbnail size video. All that stuff is done dynamically and adaptively. And all of a sudden, you know, there was somebody else in your neighborhood downloading, and they stopped downloading, and all of a sudden your pipe wi widens up and you can get more data. YouTube will now send more bits, and all of a sudden you think it's bink, becomes more clear, now you're watching 1080p 4K video. That all adaptive stuff is done by YouTube, and it's an amazing uh, engineering job. That's, that was an aside, but just, I'm impressed with the YouTube folks who make this all happen. So, talking about storage, let's think about the YouTube example. How do they even store all that stuff that they have, okay? Certainly no single hard drive can do it. The biggest hard drive I know of is about four tebibytes, four, six, I think maybe we're getting to eight, but it's not much more than that. It's you know, handfuls of, of tebibytes. One, one drive. Um, what you often do is you have a lot of these drives together, wrap it together in a big RAID, redundant array of inexpensive disks, and now you call that a larger virtual drive, but it's really a lot of smaller drives. That can handle failure, which is kind of cool. If the disk fails, you swap it back in, and nobody even knows it. It's kind of cool. Below the abstraction line of that RAID box was disks were failing all the time, but you, the user, didn't even know about it. Again, abstraction, powerful. So you got to paralyze those hard disks. That's actually pretty easy. You know, a bit, a byte is eight bits, so at the very least you got, here's eight hard drives, and each of the bits of every byte going through can go into a different drive. That's actually pretty cool, a very easy way to paralyze it. It's not often how they do that, but that's kind of a very simple first pass on how that you could do it. But we've seen concurrency and how that's an issue in general. And all those issues of concurrency come up with data storage. So how do you, act, how do you have parallel people access the data? What if at the same time you're writing and I'm reading from it? How do I not collide and how to make sure to get a consistent transaction there? And that's, rel that's relevant for your ATM, right? You know, one of you, you have a big family, you give all of them ATM cards, and all of you are trying to add money and take money away. How is it possible that the ATM system, the global system from your bank, doesn't allow two people to make two withdrawals at the same time of the same amount of money? Let's say $100 left, and two people simultaneously ask for the $100 re request. Well, if they both get say, yes, we got the money, and then by the time they actually grab it, all of a sudden they both get cash coming out, you just got $200 out of a bank where you only had 100 that's a concurrency problem. So the bank fixes that, and they, they, they were able to work with that. But that's true for data as well. I'm reading from two different places. That's usually not a problem. But I'm writing to two different places to the same place. How do you handle the fact that it doesn't just kind of overlap each other and somebody gets to win? Even in that case, it's hard to beat. You know? And you have problems. Cloud services have this issue. Dropbox, if you know, Eric and I are sharing a file in Dropbox, and we both have it in our browser, and then he saves it and I save it, it'll say, Dan's conflicted copy. They know about the fact that both of them had it, had it opened, and both of us were writing, and we actually clobbered his version. Like, they knew that I had it, he, both, he and I had the old version, and he, he wrote the new one, and I didn't then read that, make a change, and write that. That would be fine. But we both were reading the old one, he wrote it, and then I wrote it on top of it. So I clobbered his change, because I didn't see his change at all. That's an issue. Dropbox knows how to handle it. But all cloud services that have concurrency available to them have to be able to deal with this. This is true for data and hard drives at the lower level of hardware as well. How fast can you access that? And what are the physical limits? You end up putting a lot of drives together. Well, I didn't put redundancy in how to handle failures, but when the drives are together, they're very hot. So keeping them cool is a big issue for these uh, warehouse scale computing systems that have massive data, like Amazon and Google. So let's talk about technique. Now we're, that's, that's kind of how to store it. But now, now let's talk about we're going to process it, OK? And your job is to store some data. And the data is going to be, in this particular example, it's going to be a list of letters. A's, B's, and C's, okay? 
And you can also store numbers, but this particular data only has letters you want to store. Could you compress it? Could you take it and like pack, you know, you're going to go on a, on a trip to a holiday. You don't just take your sweaters and floof them out and just kind of put them in. You don't take a bag. They don't, you don't want to carry air with you. So you compress it. You, you know, put your knee and you scratch it down and you compress your stuff down. And there are even companies that will sell you a thing that will suck the air out. Like you put it in a plastic bag and it, goes brrr, and it sucks the air out of your package. And all of a sudden you get this like Ziploc clothes thing. Have you seen this at all? There's a company that does that. Okay, so that's called compression. And there are two types of compression that we can talk about in this class. One is called lossless. The other one's called lossy. We'll see the next slide. But lossless means you compress it in a way that when you want to decompress it, it's exactly a copy. So that's important for you to know. That's important for the loss. Lossless is reversible. I compress it, and I can come back to the original. Okay? Lossless, no loss, right? In the compression process, there was no loss, because I can go back to the original, no problem. Okay? Here's an example here on this slide. I got six A's, five B's, and three C's. So what I do is I take the letters of all these A's, and I say, OK, there's going to be a number and the next letter, then a number and the next letter, and the number and the next letter. Okay? We often call this a version of run length encoding. I'm looking at that, and I see a run of A's. I encode that by saying 6A. Notice that that took two characters, right? Versus six characters for A's, I just use two characters, a 6 and an A. So I've already compressed it, right? And now I have 5B five, five is now uh, two characters for a 5 and a B rather than five characters for the B. Okay, in 3C. So that's, that's great. Now, as you can see from this encoding, a lossless encoding isn't always smaller. What if I had ABC, ABC, ABC forever? What would I have? I'd have a file size that started, let's say I have nine guys. ABC, 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 that's nine characters. In this format, how many characters would I take for that? 18. I'm doubling the size, even though I'm trying to use lossless. So often what these lossless guys do is they say, okay, I try to use the technique we had, we agreed upon, this kind of run length encoding model. And I try to compress it, it didn't work. So what I'm actually sending you, yes, I'm sending you a compressed file. It's really the original file. There's a bit at the top that says, should I treat this as the original file or the compressed run length encoded file? So if I try this, we could have an agreement where the first bit of the whole file tells me, do I just read it plain or do I try to use the run length encoding? Is it encoded with run length encoding? Okay, so I, I took this file, ABC, 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 I tried to compress it. I didn't do it very well. So I set the bit to be original. That makes sense? Otherwise, if I was compressing it well, like, like in this case here, then I'm going to be compressing it, put that bit on, and say, this is the number, letter, number, letter, number, letter model. OK? So important. I alluded to this a moment ago, lossy. Lossy means I'm going to compress it, but there's going to be a penalty. Now, what's the penalty? There's a trade-off here. I'm going to lose some data, meaning I, I try to recover the original. I can't get back to the original. So that was a loss. That's, that's, that trade-off means I, I got hit. That was a penalty. What's the benefit? The benefit is lossy, you can often go smaller. Okay? So if you really need to go smaller, like with video, video is so big that we have to press it. And yes, we're going to have pixels not be exactly the same as the original, but we're going to live with it. So the trade-off is, wor in that case, it's worth the trade-off to give those pixels up because they weren't really conveying information in the first place. So how do we choose what to throw away? We try to throw away things that people won't notice. Isn't that interesting? So for example, in video, if one pixel is like flickering over here, and it's just flickering between all black and like one value above black, so it's almost black, and everything else is black, right? And I want to be able to store this efficiently. Well, I can just say, OK, here's a rectangle of black. It's this big. But if I have to remember that there's a pixel off and on, that's annoying, and it's adding more data to me. I say, you know what? That's close enough to black. I can just throw it away and say the whole thing is roughly a big black pixel, a big black rectangle that I'm sending in my video. So if you have noise, little small noise, you can often wash that away, and your compression guy can have some, uh, can, can have quite a bit of savings because you're able to throw those pixels away that actually don't matter that much as well. MP3 is a classic lossy format that you're probably familiar with. And the way MP3s work is they listen to the way human ears hurt. And human ears can hear high frequencies as well as hearing some lower frequencies. And you can have to have frequencies that are masked. Okay? So you have a main frequency, and then his frequency that's masked. I mean, I can't really hear it. Well, I don't have to store any bits for it because I'm not going to hear it anyway. But on the waveform, I'd see it. I'd see it there. But you, your ear, can't hear it because perceptually, this is being masked by the louder frequency that's maybe a lower multiple of that. So you can throw it away. That's how MP3s work. You can read about it. It's really fascinating. But MP3 is one of the classic poster children for a lossy compression. Um, 
So there are trade-offs when doing this. We talked about, you know, do I use lossless or lossy? Well, how much do I need? Do I really need the small size, and can I afford the loss? Then go with lossy. If I can't afford loss, I need to recover the original stuff because maybe this, the data originally is a lot of data, but it's census data. I need to actually know every single vote or every single measure I had. Well, I'm going to compress it as well as I can, but I need to be able to use loss less because I can't throw stuff away. I can't afford to throw stuff away. So you ask yourself on that trade-off, can you throw things away to get a smaller size or not? Okay. Here's an example for pictures. People often say, look, you can't see these low pixels that are in the blue range. People looked about what perceptually, as I mentioned, perceptual is usually, uh, perceptual encoding is usually how people decide on the lossy encoding. So with the sound, it's mass frequencies. With visual ideas, it's the idea that you can't tell many differences in blue. I don't know if you knew this before, but you can tell a lot of differences between variations in green, bright green, and yellow. A lot of, I can say, oh, I can see many different differences. But I can see many different differences in the blue spectrum. It's like black, kind of bluish, a little brighter blue, bright blue. That's kind of, I mean, it's not that coarse, but it's fewer than green, where I can see a lot of these small frequency differences, a lot of these small um, brightness differences in green. I can't see those in blue. So guess what? As I'm kind of, quote unquote, allocating bits to each channel, why give an equal number of bits to R, G, and B? I give fewer bits to B. Now I have fewer ideas, fewer levels of B, but I can't see it anyway. So that's just a way to kind of reduce bits for that. Okay, and that JPEG is a great example. And as you turn, as you turn the knob on how compressed you are and how much loss you have, here's a new word, I didn't write it here, but it's an important word for yourself, you start to hear artifacts. The word artifacts means something that wasn't part of the original data but comes as part, part of the lossy process. If you've ever heard an MP3 file that's compressed really small, like, oh, they usually measure the kilobits per second as the measure of an MP3. So, you know, 256 is a pretty good 128. Let's now go smaller. 64, there's a little noise. 32, ugh. 16, start listening to 16 kilobit per second MP3 files and it'll sound like, ugh, this is like bad AM radio. It's like you can't hear, you know, a symphony, it sounds terrible. At 16, 8, it's like zzz, buzzy. That's an artifact. That's an audio artifact that comes part of the compression, okay? So, great example of that. 